An artist should really decide how big they want to be. Everybody has a vision of like, I want to be on the stage. I want to be in the stadiums. I just, you know what I'm saying? And some people have a real thought pattern on, on where they want to be in their career. Some people say, I'm truly independent. I don't want to deal with the major at all, but I want to have the success of, let's say a La Russell, or let's say a Currency, or those in that vein. That's where I want to sit. So when I'm performing, I'm visualizing 5,000 seats, 10,000 seaters, and then festival. And there's some people who want to be super, super major. So checklist number one is I need to figure out where we're going with this thing. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. We are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. And today we have a special guest, Mr. Music Money Makeover himself, Casey Graham. What's up, man? What's going on? How y'all feeling? Man. Hey. Yeah, Thank you for having definitely me. Definitely help. I uh, appreciate you pulling up on a Saturday, man. You know, people be trying to have their weekend, <laughs> have a good time, you know. Um, yeah. But, yo, man, like, I think this sit down is long overdue. Like, yeah. I know a lot of people who watch this channel are already aware of you. For those of y'all who are not aware, Music Ma Ma Money Makeover is a YouTube channel. has a lot of great advice. You'll get a vibe of him just from this video and, and why you should watch um, his content. But like, let's just get straight into that part, and then we're gonna like rewind and get into some of the other background and things you got going on. Mm -hmm. um, like, essentially, what do you do for artists? Because it comes from really doing stuff. Like, right. you're not just giving advice online like some people are. Right, right, right. It um really what I do is I help artists build their foundation, their business foundation, so that they can build something, build mm -hmm. the record labels that they want for themselves, the DIYers out there. And, you know, the publishing companies or it, eventually if they want to sign people, mm. I help them build that foundation for themselves and others. So as they begin to grow, they don't have to look back two years after something went viral several times. You know what I mean? And, and they're like, oh, I got to fix this. Foundation mm. is key with everything that I do on the show and on the platform. So, yeah. You had a beautiful analogy, like, or just a, 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 a verbiage of like paying marketers and not paying them before they get that stuff right. Can you go do that again? Yeah, uh, so like, let's say, okay, cause a lot of my audience will come to you or mm -hmm. try to get to you or have already been speaking to you and they'll come mm -hmm. to me and they're like, oh, I, there was some stuff I did wrong. So a lot of times you got a, you got a slew of records ready to go and you want to get these records out. So you, you, you're ready to go promote. Okay, so you put all the money into promotion, but the foundation of the business isn't done. So when they pay someone like you, you're going to know what you spent mm -hmm. to do what you needed to do. You can give them all the numbers, but then when they need to figure out how much did I really spend, did this affect, you know, the debt of the project? What about all the other people I need to owe? Like, can I really account for everything? Cause you can account for what you did for them. They can't account for what they have to do for their company or their label, mm. you know? So as investors come along, they want to know, Hey, how much did you spend here? Well, I spent, you know, 10,000 or whatever. Okay, what about the rest of it? Well, you know, I paid these guys for the beats and I kind of did a little engineering and, uh, and the, the next thing you know, all the finances are all over the place. So let's say you want to sit down with a label, you know, after you got things going and they're looking at everything you have done and they're like, well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to put some numbers together for what we think you should have. You know what I mean? Yeah. Versus you coming to the table, this is what we did. Mm. And there's a lot of experience that comes behind that because I know many artists will go to the label and the one thing's like a little sliver of time that you'll take with your attorney or maybe your team and you'll begin to set up everything that I talk about. Like, like that. And then you'll do the deal. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. That's what, that's, that's, that's a, that's a explanation of what I was talking about. So we had a checklist of sorts mm -hmm. right, for our artists. I'm taking this thing seriously. I want to go about this professionally and build my infrastructure. Mm -hmm. What would be the first things that you feel like, the first five things that you feel like an artist should do? I feel that an artist should really decide how big they want to be. Everybody everybody has a vision of like, I want to be on the stage. I want to be in the stadiums. I just, you know what I'm saying? And some people have a real thought pattern on, on where they want to be in their career. Some people say, I want to be at the space where, you know, I'm truly independent. I don't want to deal with the major at all, 
But I want to have the success of, let's say, a La Russell or let's say a Currency or those in that vein. Mm -hmm. That's where I want to sit. So when I'm performing, I'm visualizing 5,000 seaters, mm. 10,000 seaters, and then festivals, right? And there are some people who want to be super, super major. So checklist number one is I need to figure out where we're going with this thing, okay? okay. And then we're going to begin to build a foundation from there. That's the company foundation. Let's go ahead and set it up. Because once you have that and I know that, then I'm like, oh, okay, this is the position we need to roll with this. We need to position you to hold your publishing, your intellectual property, your masters and your publishing for a long time, right, until you're done. Or we need to position you to build this thing out and prep you for actually doing a deal with a bigger company. So, and you, so you understand, Hey, this ain't all yours no more. You know what I mean? And we different. got a partner. Yeah. So there's two different trajectories there. So I would go from, let's get a, let's get a plan and a mission together on what your vision looks like. Let's build the foundation from there. And then after that, things begin to unfold. Kind of once you, once you see that, once you take them through the process of actually building the business before they even press go on promotions, Artists begin to ask more questions. Like, mm. okay, oh, this is really gonna take some money now. How are we gonna get this money? Well, wait, we, we wait a minute. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't need a bunch right now. We just gotta do some A-B testing. Mm. You know what I mean? But within that second step on that checklist, that foundation has a lot of steps in it. You know what I mean? Whole lot of steps. Cause like I was saying earlier, like there's a tiny bit of time before you do a major deal where you set up your whole company process if you don't have it done yet. Yeah. And that's the stuff that could have been done before. But had you done it before, which is what I found out, had you done it before, chances are you probably won't go major because you'll know what you're doing with your company. Mm. You know what I mean? Interesting. So, yeah. You know. I imagine once the artist does that too, there's probably a level of freedom or breathing room that you feel just from having all these things out of the way, having confidence in the infrastructure that is in place. Yeah, I mean, it does give you a lot of breathing room because artists only, most artists, especially the ones I consult with, really only want to sign because they feel that the work is too hard, it's intimidating, they can't do it. So right. that's really why they want to sign. Got you. But if they had the choice not to, and they had somebody to show them that, hey, it is possible to do this stuff independently, then they would do it. I think, I think a good, 60% of artists would stay independent if they didn't, if 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 it wasn't so intimidating to them. Yeah, because we know it's a crew of artists who are just gonna sign anyway. They're just gonna do it, they're just gonna do it you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we'll have old videos breaking certain stuff down and yeah, someone will be like, nah, man, I still gotta go for it. Hey. Gotta get the check or I just wanna be larger in life, which is cool. But like that goes back to what you said in the beginning. Right, you make that decision early on. Maybe mm -hmm. you might change along the way, but even if you do grow, evolve, and switch up for whatever reason, or new things open up, starting with a specific vision um, in mind just makes everything else so much easier in terms of the decisions that you're making. Right, right. And I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of people do sign because they feel like it's that one chance they got and they don't really have a team. So mm. they feel like, Man, I better take this shot right now. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. if I don't take it, I'm probably not going to have it. My team ain't really competent. I got my auntie handling some stuff for me. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm hoping I'm this, this is it. You know what I mean? I don't really know where to pull the people from. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. What, do you, what did you learn from the publishing company? We talked a little bit about that. You mm -hmm. pursued starting your own publishing company and got a lot of lessons um, about where the money goes, where it comes from, et cetera. Like, what, what's one of the, like, what, yeah, what are the top lessons from that? I mean, for me, it was, I've always been about the money from my past. I was, all, you know, as a producer, I wanted to know why I wasn't getting paid and mm. where was the money that I was expecting, uh, where, where was it coming from? So when I built my publishing company, it started off as a sync company. And I got in like way over my head. It was just really, it was too much. You know what I mean? So I was like, I'll back it down to actually just being a collector, which is essentially what Song Trust does, Tune Core Publishing, all this stuff. But in that, I was like, I'm still not sold on where the international money is. 
and I got real deep in in the weeds with it, you know, talking to people <laughs> that I'm like nobody because I started reading contracts like, OK, it's got to be here. And it's, there it is right there. Right. Let me go get it. I just learned that it is the business is just not as hard as people make it seem. You can get all the money that you're looking for internationally. And there's a specific way that this has to be set up to look right on paper so you don't look like a one-person team, mm. right? Why don't you want to look like a one-person team? Because when you begin to call around about your money, you want to you wanna look like you are holding a, a decent catalog. You know what I mean? Mm. If people, Because cause they're not looking at you like face-to-face. -face. They're looking at you on paper. Okay, who are you again? Oh, okay, it's, okay I got you, right? Everything's set up right, you know what I'm saying? In the publishing game, I learned that you if you if you're really gonna do it right, you gotta be, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go in for the for the long haul. Because if you a small person, if you one man team, it you're thinking that you're going in as a full service company. Some people may be independent labels out there who are gonna sign artists with publishing on their contracts. You are not a full service company and you're gonna stay independent. That's, it's an extremely hard job. So you got the artists, they want their money. You're dealing with time on their hands. You're dealing with time on your hands. You're dealing with no staff. And you gotta make sure you keep this client happy right here yeah. while they on the rise, yeah. looking at the money over there that they could get offered while you handling their publishing for nothing but a collection fee. So it's a tight little. I learned a lot from the publishing game, and I learned that if you're gonna be a small guy, you gotta have a gotta have a focus. Gotta have a focus. Yeah. Rewind real quick back to that those producer days. How long were you producing? I I uh I started producing music in 2004. That was the very very beginning. Um, uh, my hometown Savannah, Georgia. That's where I'm from. I had an artist. By 2005, I had an artist. My goal was to be Master P. <laughs> I wanted to be that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that was always my inspiration. Um, that didn't work out, but whatever. Um, went to college to become an engineer out in Phoenix, Arizona. Went to Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences. I was a crass grad, came to Atlanta. And that it was like, go to school, get a good job was the mentality back then. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of pretty much phased out now. Back then it was still lingering on. Um, so I started really producing heavy after the stock market crash and I was like engineering studios in Atlanta was closing down yeah. like they were. Yeah. So I was like, I got to do something else. And the producing days is what really got me into, oh, this is BMI. This is ASCAP. Okay. Well, where, where's the rest of the money? How do I get paid as a producer? Who pays me? And then, you know, What's a royalty? Where do I get that from? Who pays that? You know what I mean? <laughs> and it yeah. took years to ask these questions going down the line from engineer, engineering to producing. You know what I mean? Um, but that spawned that whole background. And I mean, I got a long history of just, just stuff, but that producing background is really what spawned the show. You know what I mean? I hope I'm answering your question the right no. way. It, you it know? is. It is. Did you... Um what made you stop? Producing? Stop producing? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I was working with an artist. I, I I was working with this artist for about six, seven years. Um, goes by the name of Baby Rose. We were doing a lot of heavy stuff. And uh, I produced her first album. And management team came in. I ain't going to say no names because I know a lot of people watch this platform. But management came in, switched some stuff up. You know, I think some communication got got crossed in that process. And and from there, me and Rose stayed cool, but it was just a fractured type of situation. And I'm not afraid to say it was it's what it is. But but um, that kind of made me stop because I had been through so many years of I got this artist. I got one artist. I'm spending money on credit cards trying to finance it. You know what I'm saying? Like and that didn't work. And I tried to get placements with this crew over here, got some money, but then they wanted too much for me. And I'm like, I don't work well in production camps. I'm trying to do the independent artist thing. I do that. But then as we build, you know, they got folks that come in. So I was at that point, this was, I think at the time Rose signed the island, it was 2020. 
And this was the first deal. And I was like, let me manage your publishing for you. Cause I was like, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not done with this, but I'm doing something. And she was like, all right, cool. Cause I'm like, you don't need a publishing deal right now. And she didn't. And to this day, she still doesn't have one. Mm. And um, I don't know what they're going to decide to do with it, but I did that because I knew that one day, I'm not going to put too much business out there. She was going to want to sell. And that day did come. And that's all I'm going to say with that. And I'm like, that's why I said, let me manage your publishing. And that gave me the inside scoop to how major label publishing works and how independent publishing works. And how nobody wants to do a split sheet. You know what I'm saying? Doesn't matter what level you at. Doesn't matter at all. Nobody wants to do them. And I don't know why, man. But 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 that's how I stopped. It was that particular. It was like it was like a management switch where people came in that weren't there in the beginning, but that watched from the beginning mm -hmm. and that cheered us on from the beginning. And I'm like. The, our initial projects got pulled down from Spotify twice, but I knew that was going to happen, sampling stuff, whatever. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I was, we, we going to get on. Let's just put it out there, but let's not look like we know what we're doing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and sure enough, it got taken down, but the whole point was we were just trying to, we were trying to get out there, and that was the switch. It didn't really have anything to do with her. It was, it was the, the team behind it. So gotcha. that's what gotcha. got me into this. I want to drop a quick note for anybody who has a fan problem. And not just any old fan problem, but the type of fan problem that we encountered after helping a lot of artists go viral, have a lot of success, get a lot of streams, but still not being able to know who exactly are my fans? How do I reach them? How do I actually leverage that to sell merch, go to a show? Because that's where Spotify leaves us without knowing who our real people are. Same for social media. If you've had this problem, I'll tell you how we've been solving it at our agency for a while now. And the pro version is just now being released to be accessible to any artist or manager out there. I'm talking about Forever Fan. A lot of the campaigns and successes that y'all have heard us talk about on this channel have been powered by that software that's made finding and understanding your true fans simple so they support you with their pockets. Because we all need a little money in this music thing. And now they're making it available to our audience for only $1 at foreverfanmusic.com slash no labels, no labels with an S at the end. And you got to put in the code no labels zero two. All right. Now, look, the DSPs, the social media platforms, I think they've shown us how much they care about artists for a while now. So at this point, we can all play naive or actually do something about it. Bet on yourself at foreverfanmusic.com slash no labels. And again, put in the code no labels zero two to get initial access for only one dollar. Let's get back to this episode. It's interesting. I, I definitely see more than than not when an artist or producer transitions more to the professional side or just out of where they are. And it might be from artist to producer and producer to artist. And sometimes it's usually somewhere around the business, not a passion for the creative part. Yeah, you saying artists don't have a passion for the for no, the business? No, no, no. I'm saying like it, it when they transition out of that creative space, mm -hmm. kind of like how you did. Mm -hmm. It's usually not. I lost passion for the creative that I was doing. Mm -hmm. It's I got tired of dealing with the business. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I I mean, yeah, man. Like that's really what it was. But I'm still in the business, though. That's that's the thing. But from a different role. From a di yeah, because but I was just trying to figure out because my whole goal through all of this stuff was where is the money? What am I missing? Because <laughs> it's like I would okay, so I'm I'm getting in the game. I got mind you, I get into rooms, I get a lot of credit for the the, the things that I do, and I'm like, I missed something here. Where was the money at that I was supposed to get right there that nobody told me about? And a mm -hmm. lot of OGs didn't do that. You know what I mean? A lot of OGs just brought me in. It's like, hey, man, you, you dope. Like, you a dope engineer. You a dope producer. Let's work. And I'm like, cool. Yeah, let's do it. We're going to get some opportunities. We're going to get some money. You know, that excited person. But yeah, like, like once you get tired of that business, man, like, you, you, like, 
something's got to change. <laughs> you got to change. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to give up on the creators because I knew that what I had been through could help them. And that's when I started building a system that would allow people to have a foundation instantly, like that. Mm. So yeah. And I'm that's still cool. not done with that system. I'm still building on it. But yeah. Mm -hmm. How mm. long will, will it take? Um, I don't know, man. I don't know how long it will take. I just know that I want it to, I want them to be able to have like a, a full suite of tools to be able to handle the back end of the record labels because that was a problem that I saw with all independent record labels. When you get started, let's say, let's say you're a producer, mm -hmm. right? Jacor, you the writer, right? Whatever, don't make a difference. Y'all making music and I'm saying I'm gonna pay I'm a friendly record label, but I don't know what I'm doing. I'm gonna pay you 3,500 a piece, which is very generous for it, right? You know what I'm saying? So now you gonna be like, yeah, all right, bet. And then I'm then I'm be like, yo, y'all so dope. I'm gonna have y'all produce the whole the whole ten track um, album. All right, cool. So and I'm gonna pay you the same amount. So now you getting 35 a piece. That's that's kind of nice. All right. Now, as an independent record label owner, I don't really know what I'm doing on the back end to actually make sure y'all continue to get paid. Mm. This is the biggest problem that I found dealing with independent. And it didn't matter if people came from major labels and started their own thing, because you know, UMG just let a couple more folks go, <laughs> and we're gonna have some more people in the mix. In the ecosystem. In the ecosystem that's doing up. this thing independently. We we continue to have bigger problems of people that work at labels or came from the older systems that don't actually know how to run the business itself mm. because they were in the system. The label was run, every every department was hand, helping you run all that stuff. So you ain't have to see it. Yeah. But when we get down to an independent place, it's like the new, the two person record label does not know how to run the business. And that's a huge problem. I don't know how long it's gonna really take to finish the system, but I'm probably hoping probably like within the next three years it can be the work can be complete and I'll be like, hey man, you know, I did it. But uh, you know? That's dope. That's yeah. dope. And, and and I think, you know, we we hear enough horror stories where yeah, people get screwed over intentionally, but I think there's a, a even bigger gap that doesn't get acknowledged like what you just said. People don't realize it's a lot of times they are dealing with people who also do not know the business. Mm -hmm. And you know, everybody's finding out in real time. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, man. And that leads to a lot of money loss, relationships, unfortunately, fractured yeah. at, at, at times. But you said that, in your opinion, is not as hard as most people make it seem, right? Because people make it seem so complicated. And, oh, yeah, publishing. Most I don't understand publishing to this day. I've been in the industry for 10 years. Like, I hear stuff like that all the time. Um, why do you think it seems so hard or that message out there is that it's so hard. I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. I thought the hardest part for most people uh, to understand that is, you know, the, the hardest part is people don't know what a mechanical royalty is versus a performance royalty. But those are the two main publishing royalties that are out there. People will say that, oh, sync royalties. No, that's just a, that's an upfront check with a performance royalty tacked on the back end for playing it on TV. It's the same thing. Mm. But people don't know because they hear print royalty, sync royalty, performance royalty. It's only two royalties. Performance and mechanical. Your print okay. royalty is coming through your, mechan your me mechanical royalties. That's it. Okay. Performance royalties are just, play. you know, when you got radio, TV, Spotify, and then whatever, and Spotify is paying you two checks for the same two royalties. There's only two. But it's like stuff that's mixed in those two royalties, and I think that's why people get it confused. You know what I mean? Got you. Got that's you. that's that's probably why they do. And then the other side is the record royalties, and that's the side that people really don't know. Artist royalties, producer royalties, they don't know how it actually gets paid out because nobody reads the contract. So, you know. Yeah, I want to piggyback on that too, man, because you've been making content in the space for a long time. And I feel like in the last three to maybe five years or so, we've seen the rise of certain music industry mediums become more entertaining. Marketing is the most obvious example, right? You know, like 2018 and now, I remember when we first started, there were like two other marketers I remember making content versus, you know, today it's a lot more of them out there. See, I don't 
because marketing is not my strong suit. I know a little bit about it, but it's not my strong suit, right? But then when you go and you look up those keywords on Google or, you know, answer the public or something like that, you'll find that music marketing is where people want to start because that's, that's the, it's like what you equate to getting out there. The last thing you're going to think about is publishing and record royalties. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's, ironically, it's the last thing search for as well. You know what I mean? So it's like underneath the shiny stuff. So that's, that's why I feel a lot of people don't. And a, a second point of that is a lot of people don't touch on it because they don't. It's too complicated. The only way you're really going to learn about it is if you read a contract. That's it. And it took me, it took, I, I asked attorneys, hey, can I, can you redact that so I can read it? I was a geek for that. Like, redact the record so I can read it, so I can see what happened with the money. Can I borrow your contract? And I was that guy that would ask, can I borrow your contract to read it? Yeah. I don't, why you want it? I ain't here. And they wouldn't care because nobody would read it anyway. You know what I mean? And so that's how I really learned the game. So I would love to see <clears throat> more people come into the space um, as... There's one woman who ran a channel called Music Business Made Easy or Made Simple or Easy. It's Made Easy. She's a publisher. I learned from her. Mm. And she exited the game recently. But wow, she, and she gave, she gave a catalog. I think she said, she told me she had like 2,500 records as a publisher. She started in the game in 89. And, 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 I, and I sat with her and she validated that my system was right. I was like, Let's do it. Let's do it. Are there a lot of changes to the publishing infrastructure? Say like marketing, right? What would you say? Nine to 15 months or so, something changes? Nah. Six months, really? Nah, it's as old as dirt. I would love to see, here's what I would love to see, man. Um, for all, oof, this is tough. For all the organizations that are part of what's called the, the not CSAC, but CISAC, it looks just like CSAC, C-I-S-A-C. Okay. It's, I like to call them the gangster organization that sits at the top of everybody, right? Um, I would love to see more smart contracts brought into place so that that question that you asked could be valid. But the publishing game hadn't changed since it was, since 1929, since ASCAP came in. It's the same thing, except for the mechanical rates have you know, been boosted, but that's about it. Wow. It's the same thing. Which goes back to my earlier question about thinking about the artist's brain and what parts of the educational journey they're on. You know, like every artist's journey is just kind of them like hitting the points when they feel like. I always go back to like, I don't know. I just feel like if I was an artist and I really cared about money, now hearing that the industry doesn't change as much, you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, if I take two to three years to figure this out, then I'm good for maybe the next 15 to 20 years, you know what I'm saying? Which is very rare. Yeah, because I mean, it's because you hear it all the time. Don't let people take your publishing. Publishing is like a, it's like stock. That's all it is. It's just stock, man. And you, you're building up your portfolio. And then eventually you're either going to pass it to your children or you're going to do a sale when you're ready to exit the game, which is something a lot of people don't talk about. They don't think about that. But I don't I don't I don't know why people don't really take the time to learn that. It's, it's something that just builds revenue over time for you so that you can actually uh, win later in life. Uh, so you can just, you know, when you're ready to leave, you didn't sell it to, you know, the, the record company for five thousand and the deal initially. And, um, you know, I know it's not making you a lot of money in the beginning, you know what I mean? And even if you do have a hit record, depending on how many people you got to split it between, like you have the boom of the record and then you know it comes down. Right. And, you, and then, it, then it'll, cause, cause it'll sit right here. It'll just be leveling, leveling out. And you can see if you really about it, you could go on Royalty Exchange. I think royaltyexchange.com is really the marketplace for selling um, intellectual property all music intellectual property. You can see there's hit records that's out there that's that's just generating a nice little job paycheck right now. Like, you know, a reg person who work a, a regular job. It just, these artists need money, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, I don't know why they don't educate themselves. On I honestly think you just kind of answered it, right? You just said something there that I think answered it. You said that in the beginning, if you're looking at publishing in terms of the payout, in the beginning, it looks really 
slow because from what I've seen, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, publishing for the most part is a long-term play. It's like a seven to 20 year minimum play, right? Like, I mean, because I guess I guess probably because <laughs> yeah. I've been in the game long enough and a lot of artists don't have money and they need money right now. And sometimes, you know, you'll see people because they need money right now, they will go as soon as they get the deal done, they will run to ASCAP or they will do the 360 deal and ask for the additional five, ten thousand on each record that is in the first option period. And then they'll go down the street. Go upstairs to ask Cap. I just signed a deal. Can you advance me out such and such amount? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, well, it's gonna be a while before that comes back. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but I understand. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I did answer that question. You know, with that. So, you know, um, it is what it is. I get, I get. It takes a lot of money to get the artists off the ground, and you're gonna need it, especially when you start moving around in the streets. The label got you moving, or your independent financier has you moving. You're gonna need some money to live on and and you know what I mean, you know, take care of yourself. So yeah. Last topic I wanna to touch on is the catalog sale. Mm -hmm. Now, we hear all these huge numbers mm -hmm. that people are selling for, but I don't think it's touched on enough that you don't have to be one of those huge artists to mm -mm. sell your catalog. Not at all. You could sell it for fifty thousand. Like it's somebody trying to buy it at fifty thousand, maybe not. But there's plenty of numbers in between, mm -hmm. you know zero and 500 million, a billion, <laughs> that like a million dollar sale, 500,000 sale, like that where it makes a lot of sense for mm -hmm. that. So can you speak on that and maybe even give a, I don't know if you have any projections, like you, if you have a, a certain amount of monthly listeners, maybe on the bottom end, here's a range that you can expect or predict. Um, I wanna shoot for, ten, I'm, a conservative number would be 10 times what the what the catalog is worth. If you are independent and nobody, or your catalog is small, let's not talk about independent majors because it's about the weight of the catalog at this point, okay. right? Yeah, if you're, if you're like a Metro Boomer, you're gonna sell for about 13 times what the catalog is worth because okay. it, got, it has that much weight. Right. So you're gonna walk out with a hefty check. And yeah, it would make sense because in your lifetime, if you if you were smart with money, you're going to know what to do. You're going to have some plays set up for that. Yeah. For someone who has a smaller catalog, it might be, you know, you, and this happens every day. That's, I mentioned royalty exchange, not to give them shout outs, but there are a lot of other companies that sell catalogs. And, and you could make that $50,000 play that you need, $100,000, $300,000 play that you need um, to sell the catalog. My thoughts on it are to get as much as you can get. Make it make sense because when you make a sale, it really is exiting the game because if you wanted to get back in, you got to start over. Mm. It just depends on how much you're selling, though. If you're selling 20, 25, 50, 30, yeah. it depends on how much you're selling. So right. make a wise choice before you sell. And, um, you know, and, and if you don't want to sell, man, just, just ride off into the sunset. You know what I mean? But if you're going to sell, get as much as you can because that's going to be it. For a minute, you know what I mean? Got you, yeah. got you. Well, hey man, I like, appreciate you having you, man. I feel like there's a, we should have you on for just some like specific topics too. Like when artists give us so much on Q&A, we don't like to touch that category over there at all, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not at all. So we're gonna have to find ways to have you on, you know what I mean, some other times this year, but appreciate you pulling up. Yes, sir. This is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary. I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. We out. Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play and courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members, and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.